Hello, welcome to part two of the Angular Motion uh, screencast. We had a look last time then at the following things in green. So uh, last lesson or last screencast, we had a look at the focus of these definitions, creation of angular motion, axes, uh, and we had a look at the calculations, definitions, units of measurement for a uh, moment of inertia in particular. We also had a real good look at uh, the stuff down here. So factors affecting uh, the size of the moment of inertia of a rotating body. We had a look at those key factors here. So we had a look at mass, distribution, distribution of mass from the axis and we had a real look at the relationship between moment of inertia and angular velocity so what that means is I mean this bit here is absolutely vital for the next part of the screencast it's having a good understanding that uh, if a moment of inertia is high then the uh, angular velocity will be low uh, and vice versa that's really important I think we really got that concept um, last lesson so what we need to have a look at now then is just finish off having a look at kind of angular velocity definition calculations units of measurement angular momentum the same and then we need to start having a look at the relationship between all three moment of inertia, angular velocity and angular momentum in a graph. So that's what we're going to have a focus on in this. Uh, we just go on to here then, quick recap um, on our relationship between moment of inertia and angular velocity. So if I start us off there then, if I could just ask you then, baby, just to pause the screencast, can you now try and have a workout between the relationship between moment of inertia, angular velocity? Just quickly, see if you can work that out. Open out, untucked position. Can we work out what that is, what that is? Likewise, or oh, sorry, in, in, in contrast, have a look at the, the picture here. So you're looking at a tucked position and have a look, see if we can work out a difference there. Okay, so you should have had something along uh, these lines. So, um, and this one, the so moment of inertia is high because of uh, the, the, the untucked position positions a distribution of mass is further away from the transverse axis which means the angular velocity is low and conversely we've got it on this side so now we have the moment of inertia is low because the distribution of mass from the transverse axis is closer okay and then on top of that um, this means that we have an increased angular velocity um, uh, so that means that we can rotate faster okay so let's have a look then let's have a quick look at our angular motion descriptors so now as we know this is our kind of equation so angular momentum is is the kind of product of moment of inertia times angular velocity so we need to now have a just make sure we can um, define and work out angular velocity so first up then angular velocity you will remember velocity um from linear motion okay so we looked at that rate of change of displacement so now what we're doing because we're talking about uh, angular um kind of velocity we now have to talk about the rate of change of um angular displacement so it's very similar okay so all you have to do is make sure that in the definition if you've got angular velocity you have to know that it's a rate of change of angular displacement okay that is the law okay so that is the definition um, i mean what i've done in brackets here is just giving you these bits so that really means rotation and it means rotation from one point to another okay and that's in a time so if you went from there that would be a key definition in a certain time hopefully that makes sense um so if we have a look down here if we look at it how is it measured so very similar to velocity but obviously now we're talking about angular displacement so basically what it's looking at is the angular displacement you are given divided by time and then to make sure you get it right it's measured in radians per second now radians per second is to do with the kind of uh, uh, the way that kind of degrees are measured or when you're moving in a circle or an angular motion it's done via radians you don't have to know anything about pi you don't have to know anything about um, 2 pi in terms of a 360 degree circle if you did a somersault all you have to know is that you will be given um, a radian and you have to then, and you'll be given a time, you just have to make sure that you remember that it's re measured in radians per second. So that's what you're looking at. You'll be given angular displacement, or you're given the, the radians, and then you'll be given the time. These are the, so basically start off with, that is um, your kind of way you work it out very simple and it makes it even easier i think when you just see it on here so this would be the kind of thing you've got you'd be given the radians so it says here the the legs of a trampoline is performing a seat drop rotate 1.5 radians in 0.6 seconds okay so from that your simple task would be calculate the angular velocity of the trampoline leanest's legs in radians per second now you probably you wouldn't get that that's that's too helpful but as you can see i mean it's not too challenging all you've got to make sure is that you remember it's radians per second okay that is it okay so if i went on to there have a quick go maybe pause that now if you've got your calculator or your phone you can use uh, so you'd have to use this as your sum okay so 1.5 divided by 0 0.6 and you'll get your answer there is 2.5 rads per second or radians per second okay so that's how you do with that so make sure you 
you've got your definition, how you work it out, uh, and then the unit of measurement. If you want to put that little example there, you can. Uh, that is the type of thing you get. Very simple. I mean, it's not really testing your knowledge, is it? Because uh, it's going to give you the majority of the information. Just make sure you know that definition. So if we go on from here, last thing then. So we've looked at, basically, we've really looked in detail of the relationship between moment inertia, angular velocity, with regard to angular momentum. So now we have a good understanding of the definition of this, factors affecting it, how we work it out, and the, and the kind of units of measurement. Same for this. Now what we have to do then is the product of this and this equaling angular momentum. So this is the overview of it. So let's have a look then. So angular momentum, what we have to know, if you remember momentum, we looked at kind of the quantity of motion in linear motion. Now we're just simply putting angular in front of it, the quantity of angular motion a body possesses. Now I put that there because that is all you have to know, that's all you're going to be asked to define, but I've just put down here, obviously we know that it's a product of moment of inertia and angular velocity, that's up there, okay, and it's, I've just put in here just to help you if, if you want to just keep that in your head, it's a rotational equivalent of linear momentum. So these are just here just to help you just to get that in your head. Now if we look at it, obviously we already know this, so how to work it out, angular momentum equals moment of inertia times angular velocity and it is measured is in kilogram meters squared per second okay so it's kilogram meters squared per second so make sure you get that into your notes i've talked about the kilogram meters and squared before when we talked about a uh, moment of inertia so if we go through here then um angular momentum okay once we've got that section complete the final thing we have to do then um you know all you've had to do so far on the screencast is get a couple of definitions uh, a couple of units of measurement and that's it so what we have to be able to do next then is interpret graphs based around angular velocity moment of inertia and angular momentum so we already know that if moment of inertia is high uh, the angular motion is going to be, oh, sorry, angular momentum is going to be low uh, and vice versa. Now what we have to do is put this into a graph with angular velocity. Once we've done that, we have a look at this concept of the conservation of angular momentum, which I'll take you through at the last part of the screencast. So let's have a look at these graphs then. What, what is it talking about? And, you know, first look at this graph, it can look a bit confusing, but it's actually really, really simple. So if we have a look then, this is the kind of things we're looking at. Moment of inertia, angular velocity, angular momentum. When it is depicted in a graph, Graph. The key point here is that angular momentum, when you look at this graph, is always going to remain constant. As we go down to, uh, in a second, we look at the conservation of angular momentum. Angular momentum always remains constant. It doesn't change because when moment of inertia goes up, the angular velocity goes down. And when the angular velocity goes up, the moment of inertia goes down. So what that means is that angular momentum stays constant. So if you have a look at it on here, you can see here, so say for example, it's got talking about a kind of tucked somersault here. Okay, so that'd be the start point, and you've got into here the actual tuck. So if you have a look at this then, you're thinking, right, so this is starting here, so if we go from here, at this point, the angular velocity, so say for example, this is the opened out position before you do a somersault. Okay, so this means that the angular velocity is low because the moment of inertia is high. If you consider that, that's because it's a tuck position. Okay, um, and sorry, an untucked position because you're you're opening your body out before you do it. I'm just thinking uh, maybe I'll be better off going on to the next bit here so you can see it. The exam question, for example, they got last year. Let me show you this and I'll show you it actually with a visual. I think that would be easier. Last year, they got this question here. So it said, explain the shape of the graph with reference to the tuck somersault from A to B. Okay, so that's what they, the, the, the question, it was asking about this, A to B, okay, and what I'm going to do is just show you this in actual visual terms, I think that would be easier. Okay, so from here, let's have a look. So if I put that here next to the graph, you can see it actually happening. So uh, the, the exam question here asks for A to B, but as we're doing this as a learning kind of a task, I'm going to go through from the start. So if you look here then, if you look across there, so you've got this bit here. So if you look here, the moment of inertia which comes across from this side, so the moment of inertia here is high, okay, because the distribution of the mass from the transverse axes is further, there's a further distribution of it. Um, so therefore, that is going to be high, whereas angular velocity on the flip side, that's going to be low because it can't rotate very well. Okay, so that is at point, uh, the rest position or the start position before you start. Now, if you go into as we go along here you can see that what happens with regard to the moment of inertia well as you get to this point point a i've tried to keep it as close as i can what happens then is the moment of inertia actually goes down to here so what you get here now is the moment of inertia is now low 
there is less resistance to kind of uh, changing the state of angular motion it's because the trans the distribution of the mass from the transverse axes gets closer so this means there's a tuck position so you can see that in action there so the moment of inertia gets low which directly means that the angular velocity gets high okay and then once you've got that you then come to the point at the end after they've done their tuck somersault and they start to come to land they have to then change it again because they want to now they want to lower, so increase their moment of inertia, increase their resistance to angular moment, uh, angular uh, motion, and that will mean that they lower their angular velocity, and this allows them to untuck and then get into the land position when they go to land on their feet at the end. So you can kind of see how that works. Now, I, I think that is pretty straightforward. I understand the graphs going up and down can be a little bit confusing, but as you can see, that is the type of question you could get with regard to... Um, you know, the relationship between the moment of inertia, angular velocity and angular momentum. What we know, what we know is that we have a real good understanding of moment of inertia. If that's high, angular velocity is going to be low and vice versa. All we have to add on here is that because when one goes high and the other one goes low, angular momentum is constant. There is a conservation of angular momentum. So that gives you a nice, easy way of answering this. And, and I'll put it down to here. So this process uh, is a, because when in the different positions, the, the two uh, kind of go against each other, this means that there is always a conservation of angular momentum. It stays constant all the time because of the two things that lead to it. Okay, so that's that. Um, let's have a quick look then uh, at the following conservation of angular momentum so if I just kind of take you on to this then the conservation of angular momentum basically um, this is something that is part of the specification it's also a question that was asked um, last summer for second years so we understand the concept of the conservation of angular momentum um, because if um, whatever when the angular velocity is is high the moment of inertia is low so what we need to do then is be able to put this and have an understanding of why so this is due to something called the angular analogues of Newton's first law of motion. Okay, so let's have a look. What is it? What's it based on? And we, sh we know the first law of motion with regard to linear motion. We know that it's kind of the law of inertia. A body will remain at rest at, at or uniform velocity until an external force is applied. When it comes to um, the angular analog, the angular version of Newton's laws, what it's asking then is this. The underpinning principle, this isn't the law, but it's just saying what's behind it, is when an object is rotating, its angular momentum remains constant, providing no other force acts on it okay so when we're rotating so it doesn't want to change we talked about it didn't we in linear motion when you have uh, say for example you hit a golf ball okay off a tee okay when it's in in the air it wants to stay at that kind of uh, uh speed okay but until you have air resistance in this case or if you had gravity acting on it when we're looking at it from a, a rotational point of view we're just saying that it wants to stay at that rotation speed unless you get an external force acting upon it so the actual law you have to know, and this is the only thing really off this page you have to analyze, you have to actually remember, is this. Okay, so a rotating body, we've said body but in the other law, so a rotating body continues to turn about its axis with constant angular momentum unless acted on by an external force or torque, which is a turning force. Okay, so that is the definition we have to say. Okay, and basically this then underpins the things we've talked about here, the conservation of angular momentum. So I get this bit, um, you know, might come a little bit confusing, but it's basically just the case of learning this law. If I show you how this works in action with regard to an exam question, which you might see, I mean, ultimately, it's very repetitive, this stuff. And all we really need to remember is this stuff linking the moment of inertia being high, angular velocity being low, that leads to the conservation of angular momentum. Um, therefore, we just have to have a knowledge of um, this to add on to it. So this is an exam question that came up. I think it's quite useful to see it. So explain, using the angular analog of Newton's first law of motion, the concept of the conservation of angular momentum. So you can see here, you got two marks from this with regard to defining the, the uh, angular analog. So if you have a look down to here, and then Okay, you've got another mark for saying what angular momentum is with regard to the kind of def sorry the the product of moment of inertia and angular velocity, and then you've got this nice easy bit here just to say that a change in moment of inertia 
will cause a change in angular velocity, okay, to conserve momentum. So you've got this bit here that we've talked about all the way through um, this unit of work so far, okay? So that, to me, I think is really important. And I know if I was studying it, I'd really want to make sure that I saw this, made notes on it. Okay, thank you.